going to just talk from here, so I hope I'm not, well, blocking, you'll have to shuggle around a bit, but, um, yeah. So, I'm going to talk really about the science behind past sea level change. I have to say that I don't work on sea level change today, I don't work on climate change induced sea level change. But I can talk a bit about why sea levels changed in the past and give you an idea of how that's affected Orkney and um, kind of help us to hopefully think about things in the future. And then Julie will take over with some actual cases from Orkney where things are happening on the coast, I think. <laughs> so, so um, talking about sea level change in the past, it's really the product of two separate things. Well, this is very much the sea level change that I work on in the research that I'm doing. And so uh, what I'm interested in is the way in which um, past sea level change impacted on the early populations of northwest Europe. And particularly I'm interested in the sea level change that took place at the end of the last ice age. And that's the product of two different things, which are really um, changes in the amount of water in the ocean, which the technical term is used to see, and changes in the height of the land, isostasy. So I'm just going to run through uh, those in a little bit more detail, first of all. So this is very much thinking about the past, and if we go back to the last great ice age, obviously quite a lot of water is taken up in the ice that formed around the world. And very, very generally, we can say that at the height of the last ice age and, and towards its end, uh, sea levels around the world were about 120 metres lower than they are today. So the world, the land, looked very different to the land that we know today. There is a caveat, and I'll go into it in a little bit more detail. It's not a, a sort of general drop around the world of 120 metres. It's not an even drop. And that's one of the kind of bugbears that I always have when you get these statements coming out from NOAA, the North American Oceans people, saying sea level's risen by 50 centimetres around the world since such and such. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't rise the same in every place. Um, <clears throat> if we're thinking about water in the ocean today, it's a more complicated picture because, of course, we're not just talking about ice, we're talking about rainfall. Um, so today the, you're looking at a lot of other things. And also there is this business about where, what, it, what is sea level? I mean, we know that sea level changes because we see high and low tide. So are you talking high tide, low tide, average, mean, spring tide? What are we talking about? But sea level is impacted by other things as well. It's impacted by air pressure. We all know we hear about storm surges when you get very low air pressure. That can cause uh, the, the sea level to rise just because air pressure is lower. Um, you also have local gravitational impacts of the land on the sea. So that near to a very large land mass like Greenland, you'll get an impact that's very different from, say, the coast of Scotland and things. So it's a very complicated picture and it involves a lot of complex maths and modelling and things. And that isn't what I do. I let other people do all of that. And then I try and, uh, when I'm looking at the past, try and think about how the changes would have impacted on the communities of the past. Thinking then about this business about the land, changes in the height of the land. Well, I think... Um, it's a fairly familiar idea today that the Earth's crust isn't a kind of rigid, fixed surface, but it's actually flexible. And one of the things that has impacted on it 
is when you have, for example, large volume of ice on um, a part of the Earth's crust. As you can see in the top picture, you can have an ice cap forming. And then the weight of just the simple weight of that ice will depress the Earth's crust underneath it. But if you think about it, if you sit on a lilo or put your finger into a balloon or something, you don't just get a depression under the weight, but you get a rise at either side of it. You get what's called a fore bulge. And so all of this impacts on past sea levels because that's impacting on where the actual land is. And perhaps one of the best illustrations of that uh, comes from the past. You've got the landscape, uh, the great landmass that we now call Doggerland here. And that lay between two ice caps, the massive ice sheet over Norway and smaller ice sheets here over Scotland. And so they're both depressing the Earth's crust and the land in between will rise very slightly. When you counter that, when you measure that against drops in sea level, you get the formation of this great land mass here. One of the things that sea level specialists, when they're talking about past sea level change, and indeed to be accurate, we should be doing the same when we're talking about sea level change today, You'll, they will always talk about relative sea level change because relative sea level change is a very, very different thing to absolute sea level change. And um, my friend Rona from Bury drew up this picture for me, which I just love it. But um, trying to illustrate that. So you've got the sea here and you've got a, a piece of land and some happy little hunter-gatherers camping by the sea. Now, if the, sea, if the land stays stable and the sea rises by 10 metres, that's an absolute sea level rise of 10 metres. And this um, little campsite will be washed away. <coughs> However, if the sea level rises by 10 metres and the land also rises, it rises, let's say, by 5 metres, well, that's going to counteract the rise in sea level. So the result is a relative sea level rise of five metres. That's the amount that the height of the sea against the land has changed. And it can also work if the sea level rises by 10 metres, again, but if suppose that the land rises by 20 metres. Well, the result of that is that relative sea level actually falls. So although the amount of water in the ocean has gone up, the height of the sea against the land has dropped. So in that case, you have a relative sea level fall of 10 metres. And your hunter-gatherers are going to find that instead of smoking fish and things, they're much more sensible to go out and look for reindeer because they'll be higher up. So really just, um, just something that you'll often hear people talking about relative sea level change. And that's what it means, that they're summing up the difference of what's happening in the sea against what's happening on land. Now, you're all here in Orkney. Some people are probably here on holiday. Quite a lot of people, I think, living here. We've got fantastic archaeology here. You can go out and visit the sites. You can read in the newspaper every week of work going on on the archaeology and things. You get the impression that we know an awful lot about the archaeology of Orkney. But because of these past changes in sea level, if we're only looking at the land as we know it today, then we're missing a good chunk of the picture. And that's one of the things that I just hope to kind of emphasise, perhaps. So if we look, for example, at Doggerland, well, nowadays, it's possible to really reconstruct in considerable detail what that would have looked like uh, at a time when it was dry land, when people were living out there. And we've got artefacts and things. We're beginning to get more and more evidence of the communities. And this picture really is just to give you an idea of some of the topographic detail that you can pull up. Detail of lakes and hills, 
rivers, all sorts of things going on out in these places. So we can really begin to study this underwater landscape. And this is something new. It's something that really wasn't happening sort of 30, 40 years ago. And it's come about largely because of our enjoyment of the oil industry. It's come about through development of technologies, albeit on a massive scale, but which we are now scaling down, as I think you'll see from some of my pictures. And we're using them, we're able to bring them to bear, to look at the underwater landscape and to look at the archaeology there. So you're talking about a whole array of different technologies. Uh, sonar technologies to look at the seafloor, seismics which allow us to penetrate below the present seafloor and look at old land surfaces, uh, LIDAR, all sorts of other things. And these are all the technologies, in fact, that I and my colleagues are using here in Orkney in order to look at the underwater landscape and changes in sea level around Orkney. We can also do things like taking sediment cores. So here we are in the Bay of Firth, um, extracting sediment cores, which can give us information relating to past uh, climate, to the landscape, to vegetation, pollen, um, all sorts of things going on that we can get information on. But I'm not, I haven't really got time um, to go into it in a lot of detail here. But um, there's a lot of information out there if you've got the kind of time and the money and the specialisms to go chasing it. And these different techniques all complement one another. So you wouldn't really ever be using one of them. You'd be using everything or a whole load you select. It's a kind of toolbox and you select what you need depending on the questions you want to answer. So you might be doing sonar survey of the seabed and then you can combine that with a seismic survey to look at what you're seeing on the seabed to try and work out whether it's uh, something archaeological left by people or perhaps something natural and geological. <coughs> you might then use the seismic information um, to tell you where to core, for example, where to put in sediment cores. So here's seismic from the Bay of Firth, uh, there, here's a core site, here we are taking the core and then looking at the, the core once we've sliced it open and deciding where to take pollen samples, where to take samples for different types of analysis. And by doing that, we can build up a graph of how sea level has changed in the past. We can build up a chart. And so this is uh, one of the charts for Orkney, and it shows us uh, here the red dots at sea level rise, past rising sea level in Orkney since the end of the last ice age. Um, and then you can see other dots that are related to similar samples <coughs> taken along the north coast of Scotland. So it helps us to put Orkney into a Scottish context. And what you can see uh, from this is that if you go back 8,000 years ago, uh, sea levels somewhere around here, about 8 metres below present. So 8,000 years ago, we've already got a population here in Orkney. They've been here for a few thousand years. Um, if we come forward in time, 7,000 years ago, well, this seems to be quite steep steep rising, steep change in sea level at first, but then you can see that it tails off as we come up to the present height. And here you've got mean sea level, uh, mean high water and things. So in fact, it reaches roughly, present heights roughly 3,000 years ago. Uh, but we're still collecting data on individual locations and things. Now, obviously, what we're here for tonight is not to look so much at the past, but to think about the future. But one of the things that modelling the past can do is it can help us start to predict likely changes in the future. And so uh, we can start to look at different areas of the coast, different areas of Orkney, and think about how sea level change might affect us. 
Now the first thing that you have to do when you're starting to model future sea level change is to think about the scale of your model. For example, you can do very sort of global scale things or you can come right down to an individual site. Here's uh, Scarabray in the Bay of Scale. And it's really, really important to make these decisions and to make your work, make sure that your work takes place at the appropriate scale for the sort of uh, information that you're hoping to draw from it. For example, there's been a lot of work done modelling sea level change around the North Sea, past sea level change around the North Sea. And here you can see uh, some of it drawn from a paper in 2013. And it's really, really useful. It shows us uh, quite gross changes in sea level. It shows us rates of sea level and things. But it really isn't telling us very much about what is happening in, in Orkney. Because the scale of the model means that Orkney is just so small that we can't really see what's happening in Orkney. So we want to come down to a scale that's more appropriate for Orkney. And we can do that. Uh, we can look at maps of Orkney as a whole and model past sea level change onto them. So if you go back some 11,000 years, uh, Orkney is probably two islands. So this is perhaps what it was like when the first people were coming to Orkney, when people were starting to explore the archipelago. They still have to come across by boat, um, but essentially they're probably going to get sucked up into Scapa Flow, but Scapa Flow is a large bay. As you can see, it doesn't have an exit uh, to the west as it does today. If we come forward in time, some 8,000 years ago, Orkney is starting to break up into a series of islands, but you can see it's still quite different to Orkney as we know it today. If you come forward 5,000 years ago into the Neolithic, it's beginning to look much more like the Orkney as we know it today. And the differences are really very small. But even with a model at this sort of scale, it's still not terribly helpful. If you've got a pet site or you're thinking of buying a house and you want to know what's going to happen <laughs> um, at that particular location, this isn't going to tell you very much about that. And one of the problems is that whatever's going to happen in any one spot, it's very, very dependent on local topography. It's dependent on all sorts of factors, like what's the geology like? Are you dealing with a hard rock area or an area that's mainly sediment? Things like that. And those of us who um, frequent the shores of Kirkwall, we all know that. I'm sorry, this is a bit faded, but... We've see, we can see that happening. Um, here you've got the PDC, Kirkwall Town, the harbour, the marina, um, the corn slip and things. And I think most people who live in Kirkwall will have experienced a flood at some time. But now we've got a seawall in. Well, a seawall is just a modern approximation of old kind of coastal barriers. Sand dunes, for example, would act as a barrier. And they'll hold back the sea so that you can have sea rising out here. You can see it today if there's a storm surge. Sea level can be higher out here than it is in here. So it can hold back the sea. And the sea won't breach this area until it overtops the barrier. So you need your models to be very, very local. And we can do that. We can look in that sort of detail. Here you can see the Bay of Firth, and um, some of the pictures that I've shown you have shown us working in the Bay of Firth. It's a very interesting area because here you've got Finstown is back in here somewhere. Um, out at the mouth of the bay, you've actually got a slightly higher area of topography. It's underwater today, but in the past it held back the sea. So that if we go back, about seven and a half thousand years, most of the Bay of Firth is, is in fact um, the turquoise, which is intertidal zone. So the Bay of Firth is mainly dry land and intertidal zone with a massive intertidal area. Now, for the hunter gatherers living in Orkney, that would have been really important because it's going to be a really resource rich area. As we come forward in time, you can see the sea flooding in. But still with quite a big in 
feet of tidal zone and still some sort of land in areas that today are underwater. And then you can come right forward in time up into the Bronze Age and it looks much more like um, the Bay of Firth that we know today, although there are still some differences. Now this sort of model, that's when it begins to get really useful, both for seeing how it's going to impact on communities living in these sort of areas and how it might impact on individual sites. And this becomes really crucial then if we start thinking about interpreting some of our sites because what it means is that with regard to, say, our Neolithic sites, we don't actually know where the coast was for any of our Neolithic sites. We have to model the coast for them. So we've been doing a bit of work uh, around the Nessa Brogga. Here you've got the Nessa Brogga up here. This is looking across the, um, the brig. You've got the watchstone there. Um, so where was sea level when the Nessa Brogga, when they were strutting their stuff? Well, we can do that. We can pull together lots of different techniques. Um, here are some of the things that we've been doing in Orkney. And then we can start to put together a model to see what it would have looked like. And you can see that the landscape was very, very different. Nessabrocker's down here somewhere. Um, here's the Loch of Stennis, uh, still a much smaller freshwater loch. Um, here you've got a kind of reed marsh, swampy area. Uh, the brown um, is a kind of, is, we've got it down as rock because, of course, we don't know how much sediment was on top of that. Um, it probably was land just with grass and so on, but you can see that the little uh, isthmus on which the Nessabrogga stands was at least twice as wide as it is today when work starts at the Nessabrogga. So these impacts can actually be quite big. But what about the future? Well, what happens when sea level rises and goes on rising and sites are inundated? Well, some sites will survive. Sites can survive a slow inundation. Of course, it depends a lot as well on marine conditions. And in a lot of Orkney, we have very high energy waters, so that will uh, work against site survival. But there are other parts of Orkney, and there are lots of places around the world where sites have survived underwater. This is um, in Denmark, uh, in Danish waters, and here you've got fantastic antler axe with its haft still in place. And that's just lying on the seabed. So it's been covered by a bit of sediment. Sediment's uh, been washed away. And uh, there's a whole Mesolithic site there. And there's lots of examples from around the world of this sort of thing. Um, here's a, a graveyard, a Neolithic graveyard, so a little bit older than Scarabray, uh, in Israel, um, where material is coming up. And here, in fact, is a village uh, associated with the site, with the graveyard, uh, with a well, and uh, remains of stone structures and things. Not, I mean, it's not the same sort of structures as Scarabray, but not dissimilar to Scarabray. So, there is potential in areas uh, where conditions are right for things to survive. I would say one thing, just looking at these, um, you can see that the, the surrounding sediment is very sandy. By and large, in Orkney, we don't have those sort of conditions. We have very uh, stony um, seabed, and that makes it much more difficult to recognise sites. But just quickly looking at other places around the world, um, here in Australia, working on a rock shelter uh, with archaeological material in it. Uh, in Japan, shell midden sites. So there's, there's plenty of examples from pretty much every continent nowadays. But one thing which all of these sites have in common, I think, is that we, I mean, anyone who lives in Orkney knows that archaeology, even doing archaeology on land is expensive. Doing archaeology underwater is much more expensive, not least because you have such good preservation. Um, and it's very slow, you're much more conditioned to uh, sort of weather conditions in a way, rough seas and things can impact on your work. So there are issues about looking at sites that have uh, been inundated, for example, but, you know, it is possible, 
and it can be fun. Now, Julie's going to talk more about where sites are eroding on the coast. I'm not talking about that because I'm very much looking um, at the, the underwater side of things. So really, um, just to draw to, to a close, one of the things I think that's come to me from all the work that I've been doing is the realisation that for those people who were living in Orkney, say, 5,000 <coughs> years ago, um, they were, for them, sea level change was normal. They were living in a world that was constantly changing. And we have the benefit of hindsight. We know that it was going to stop, that about 3,000 years ago, sea level stopped rising. But they didn't know that. As far as they were concerned, it was going to go on. So you do wonder, you know, how did that affect their worldview? It's also interesting to me because we get very worried and upset about sea level change. And it's true to say we are much less flexible than they were. We have much greater population. We rely on very inflexible things like cars and roads. It's not so easy for us to move our settlements and things. But one of the reasons that we've got into that situation is because we've been living in a very stable world. For them, the world wasn't so stable. They had to build that kind of um, instability. Well, they didn't have to build it into their way of life because it was, it was their way of life. That was just normal. Whereas for us, it's the change from stability to instability that is, you know, a real issue. Plus, I think... The, the way in which our, our way of life now, it's, it's not conducive to sort of, we're not maybe quite as resilient as they were, or we have to think of different ways of being you'll resilient. You'll see the links as we go um, on. <laughs> um, but um, I'm starting at the other end, <laughs> if you like. I'm starting um, in, in today, and here we are uh, with uh, an advertising all these vibrant ca capital, the Norse adventurers. Um, the, the, the thought about where we are today, um, about our relationship with the sea and our relationship with the past is, is really um, significant when we consider how we're going to deal with the changes that Caroline was speaking about because although those background Changes may have slowed down. Um, now here we are again with a speed up, um, with the uh, with the human-induced climate change that we actually have to um, think how we're going to manage the changing the changing landscapes. So um, uh, I'll just I'll just move on from there. Okay, to. Now this is a, a hopeless slide for people at the back of the room, but basically what I'm going to talk about um, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is um, a selection of all these different parts of maritime cultural landscapes. So I'm going to talk about settlements, fishing structures, towns, um, so inhabited places, isolated places, isolated places that were inhabited briefly. Um, I'm going to talk about the evidence we have of the past from um, folklore and saints. I knew all of you, a lot of you will have, um, be aware of Sarah Jane Gibbons' work and um, most recently a publication that she's made with uh, James Moore about identifying um, the path of St Magnus. Um, has, uh, is a really brilliant piece of work um, and in a way our way of studying the landscape is, um, has to include all these different things um, place names um, military buildings all this stuff so that we can see how people actually inhabit the landscape and you know there's an old lie that says that um, Orcadians were farmers that had a boat, where Shetlanders were fishermen that had land, and of course it's a big lie because in both in in both places um, people would specialise in both those things. Um, 
And in Orkney, we've been a maritime cultural landscape since people were here because they all came by boat and the boats were essential and the shore and the resources were essential. So um, I'm going to dot about a bit <coughs> through time. So it's only a thousand years, which in Caroline's world just goes by like that. <laughs> so um, here, you know, when we're now looking much more closely down the, um, through the binoculars of time, we're, we're looking at the, all the wrong way up. <coughs> Caroline's looking broad, and now we are focusing down. So um, what's, what I'm going to show you here is snapshots from round the coast um, looking at this massive cultural landscape that we've got and inquiring, I think, a, a little bit about actually what do we know about all this in the last thousand years. I mean, we do have history, we've got some lovely history, but um, in order to find out about um, people in a place, we have to combine a lot more evidence. Now, um, it so happens, of course, that for a lot of Orkney, um, for, a lot, for the last thousand years, uh, people have been living in this coastal strip really very, 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 very close to the coast. See this little blue arrow here? This is Scale Farm, West Ness Rousey, currently under excavation, um, led by Dan Lee and Ingrid Mainland, um, with the help of Sarah Jane and other um, members of the community, because here we're lucky that archaeologists are members of the community, so uh, community excavation means that the archaeologists, professional archaeologists, can take their kids and we can all en enjoy ourselves doing the, the job that we love. And here we are, uh, the, the team has been down at Scale Farm in West Ness in Rousey and, I, and um, uh, Sean has helped the news of this um, new find, which is the old hall for uh, West Ness, which is mentioned in the sagas. This may well be it that was mentioned in the sagas, coming out from underneath the building there. And um, the news of the world, no, it wasn't, it was the sun, had the great headline, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a, a lovely day of drinking call. So, best, best headline for We Wild for archaeology. But, the point about this thin strip of development is that, for instance, we have a brock here, we have a chamber tomb here, we have another brock here, we have a church here, we have the unbelievable drinking hall here, um, and as we go down, we have an Iron Age settlement, we have um, a Viking settlement and Viking break. And all of that is in with 100 metres of the coast, and behind that, we have a lot of rather interesting fields. And um, there are bits and pieces of archaeology, like settlement archaeology within those fields, but this rhythm of coastal settlement is vital to understanding what's been going on in the last thousand years. And of course, that's the bit that's getting battered by the, by the sea. Um, and um, uh, where there's a lot of archaeology falling out. So the problem with all of this is, of course, if you dig the sites that are falling out, you don't know how much you've lost already. So it's very nice just to take back steps, just 10 metres back, and be, start, uh, be actually looking at a small portion of uh, some part of settlement where you have, might have a, a greater grasp on what you're doing. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it is wonderful to do the coastal sections. You can pick where you like, you can sample stuff, but actually put it in better context just to do a tiny retreat is a great thing. But there's nowhere much to retreat to in a lot of cases. Um, there's the well settled areas of the islands. So here we go, um, people of the sea. I'm just putting in a, a, some happy snaps here, really, um, to remind you how much part of the sea um, people have, how connected the sea people have felt 
through um, generations. And here is um, uh, one of the Viking boat graves from Westness in Rousey, just a few metres from the, off the bottom of the picture I showed you earlier. Here's all the little boat rivets inside of the grave. There we are. In some places they're kind of overlapping because it was an old boat and it had been mended, so there were double ones of rivets and things. And here is this man with his shield um, on his head and his sword by his side, uh, buried in a boat. It's important enough to bury people in. And uh, most recently, a couple of years ago, um, there was a woman uh, found in, in a similar small boat in Papa Westry, and before that there were three people who were found in the Scarboat grave. So you see, this is something that was really significant to the people of the Viking period. Mm -hmm. um, they felt that attachment to the sea, the need to bury the boats was quite strong. And then there are other boaty references, or fishy references rather, um, in, for instance, combs. And there's a great article by uh, Clark and Heald looking at the symbolism of some of the combs, for instance. These artifacts are quite significant to people, personal to people in the past. And these fishtail combs, um, double-sided, looking like little bodies of fish. And uh, these are particular to the north of Scotland, Orkney and Shetland. And they're very um, uncommon elsewhere. So there seems to be some um, cultural significance to this design. Um, here we have um, um, this, you'll have to believe me, is a picture, is an outline of South Ronaldsey, and all the dots on it are chapels and churches around the outside edge, and most of the dots are chapels and churches around the outside edge. And I'm just showing to you um, that, once again, when we talk about medieval and later stuff, living on the edge is really important. Being on the edge is really important. And so when we're looking at how we can serve and work with our landscapes, the, the edges are so vital. And here um, I pop in the St. Magnus footprint stone from St. Mary's of South Romsey because um, this is the stone that St. Magnus surfed his way for, across the Pentland Firth on and arrived. And there's the proof. So there you go. It's but important enough that he came in miraculously across the sea on a stone. So, um, now this guy is a hero, a total hero. Charlie Simpson in Shetland has managed to capture um, what the Shetland Times called an oral map of Shetland from the sea. So, some of the information that one can capture um, is very slippery stuff. And... Um, you need to get it now and, um, because not only are, is the information being eroded on the edge of the shoreline by storms and uh, um, we have this need to adapt and look after that stuff, but also just cultural change and technology, the, the changes due to technology are eroding what, how we understand our ancient landscapes or the landscapes of our ancestors. So Charlie Simpson has um, written a book about how people speak about seascapes. And um, so when you're at sea, how do you navigate? If you're close in to the shore, you navigate with marks. How do you know which is a good fishing ground? How, how do you know how far away you are? Well, you know, there's a famous song, Rowing Fula Doom, which is, if you're very far away, even a really high island like Fula disappears below the horizon. Okay? So, um, one of the ways of saying how far away you are is where does the sea appear to go to? Okay? That's one way. So, you can, so one of the um, 
one of the ways of speaking about how far away you might be from, from the land is to say, when the water's in the valley. Okay, because that's what it looks like when you're far away. It looks like the water's in the valley between the hills. And then you can say exactly where you are on that far away place by taking marks from the hillside. And these, na these names um, that he, he's talking about are great. I mean, some of them are quite modern. There's a, there's a name that he quotes in there that's Besooth the Ice Cream Van. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's only parked an ice cream van in a field, and, no, and then that was being used. But, of course, now we don't need all those marks because we have a sat-nav. We just turn the phone on and it says where you are. But in days, of, uh, in days past, people had to explain where they were going, what the tides were doing, and how to navigate around between the islands. And this hasn't been done yet for Orkney, um, but it has been done for Shetland. And Charlie Simpson um, did it in, uh, and published it in 2010. And between him getting his information and the book coming out, several of his informants died, you know? So it was, it's quite key to um, understanding lands landscapes and seascapes to get these sorts of things done. Um, anyway, I'm just encouraging somebody who might just feel like getting, a, getting an urge to do this stuff, to just go and do it. Because um, it, it does exist in Orkney. Um, Rosemary Joy, um, uh, who published a book on Edie, um, talks about uh, Big Point Hill Chamber 2 and the Stone of Setter when they're lined up, showing the way in through Calf Sound to um, the safe safety of, of Carrot Bay. Um, then there are these things. The, uh, no, I offer you both spellings. <laughs> right. Um, and who cares really? But still, they're both they're, they're, they're up there. The um, noosts are everywhere around the coast. They're extremely um, fragile little creatures that uh, get seven bells battered out of them by the sea and it's no wonder because they are the places in which people put boats to take them um, just out of the sea but be available for putting into the sea again or winter nests are higher up and these are probably winter nests here so a lot of a lot of 19th century nests even have now been eroded away and you just see very short ends of them left and sometimes they're suspended on vertical cliffs you know, you don't, nobody ever hauled the boat up vertically onto that. It was when, the, when there was a bit more of a slope in front and the nooses were longer. Um, uh, John Hunter dug one of these some years ago. Um, great enthusiasm, great big noose at Hernips Point of Deerness. And um, just the very shape of a Viking boat you know, heart pounding, and got to the bottom of it and found a bovril bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but because this is Orkney, because this is Orkney, he was rewarded by also finding a chamber tomb and, um, and identifying this mound that was next to it, which was the tail end of the chamber tomb. So, never be disheartened, I say. Um, Charting landing places, you know these clear, clear strips down the shore, this can tell you a lot about where the traffic was in the past. You can see one here, that's down the South Long Sea with a winch at the top of it, which is a help. <laughs> if you're just wondering, was this something? But that's the joy of new historical archaeology. With any luck, there's a postcard somewhere <laughs> from 1920 with it on it. Um, anyway, and here is, uh, here we are in, in Stromsey, this sort of landing place, very difficult. 
um, what can we do about trying to find out whether this was ever used for landing boats or not? Well, there are things, I mean, there are the postcards like this, or, you know, photographs, or there are, the, uh, one of the things that Hugo did was when he was walking around um, Orkney looking in for prehistory, is he found ballast on the beaches. And so it's foreign stone <laughs> brought to a beach and dropped, and then bits of foreign stone accumulating over the repeated visits <coughs> that can sometimes lead to marks. So you can do it. It's not impossible. Um, there is a lot of this about, and, and I'm sure most of you here will have been drawn to these sort of coastal places where, you know, there's scrappy bits of masonry or big bits of masonry, and down below here, you have to trust me, in the dark, it are huge fish mittens. And this is at um, Stapelbray in Edy, which is a, a lovely medieval site that was a lot lovelier 30 years ago, um, with a lot more information um, potential. Uh, and now, with seven bell, bells battered out of it, that's beginning to shrink. Um, as a rule of thumb, you can see these grand settlement mounds sometimes with a thin strip maybe of archaeology in the front and then a couple of years later there's a fatter strip of archaeology in the front because you're getting into the centre of the settlement mound so you've lost a bit of it and then maybe 20 years later you'll find that the um, lovely archaeological strip at the front of the mound is, is getting lower and that is because most of the mound is gone now okay so this is the case of this particular settlement mound here as it is getting lower okay there's getting less of it as we go on and it's always getting less of it but sometimes you get less of it with the greater depth anyway so here we are this is full of fish mitten telling and jane jane harland and has been out there and sampled it and is finding out lots about medieval trade in fish. And um, the medieval trade in fish, really exciting stuff. In, um, the, I think there's a, a lovely a, a historic record from the 14th century where the um, exchequer, Scottish royal administration were buying 1,500 fish from Caithness, for instance. Big, big trend, possible. Or you can look at um, <laughs> big skeletons, uh, potentially. Um, this, was a, this is a great thing. This is where Jane um, found a, a a Neolithic house site and came across the burial site for quite several whales that had been hunted in the 19th century, rendered headless and then buried because um, a nearby land, landowner didn't like the smell of the remaining heap of whale. And, uh, and as she had to travel by it on a daily basis, she asked for the whales to be buried. And now, in the 21st century, there is this grand resource that could tell us about the seas around Walkney, can tell us about um, the difference between whales now and their, for instance, the amount of heavy metals in them, and whales of the past. So this is, this is, you know, this is all adding to our understanding of our maritime cultural environment, whether it's as modern as this or as ancient as that, which is the mean of the cast. So back here, um, to now slamming close the slips, here's my here's the nouse again. Um, and here's um, just a reminder that uh, John Hunter's excavation at her next point uh, was a good Okay, here's Sigrid and Callum's excavation of the boat houses at uh, Moness uh, in um, Rousey, in West Ness in Rousey. 
And here's some work that, um, that I, was, um, I started and um, was taken on by Ted Pollard um, some few years ago. So this is Wheelie's Ting in Papua Street. This is, um, there's a lot of work going into this spit of land here. Several structures have been built on it and from it and out from it and a gap has been made into it. This is the sea and this is land. This is Orkney where it's not always so easy to tell what's land and what's sea. Uh, this is flooding due to rain and this is a high tide or middle tide I should say. Uh, Wheelie's Ten. So what is Wheelie's Ten? Well, who knows really. Um, there seems to be um, some medieval or later building work that has gone on on this. And so there it is on the east coast of Papua Westry. Um, Wheelie's Ten is a name that doesn't give much away. It could well be just the shape of the of the thing itself that's caused the, the naming of it. Um, and my colleague who co-wrote, Ted Pollard, who co-wrote um, the paper with me suggests that maybe it was Wheelie's thing and it's to do with resting places for burials, but I can't really agree with that because this is in between the tides and I know nobody's um, going to do that. So, um, so we had some disagreements in our in our publication, but um, this we did a sort of a, an intensive look at this one bay on the um, side of Papua Westry, and those various piers and loosts um, recorded all the way along bits of wreck. Um, similar. Jobs being done in the ooze um, in Shackensey. This is a this is a, a piece of uh, very shallow enclosed water that is. Uh, this is actually silting up. So this is different to most of our scenarios where we can't tell what's going on because it's being eroded. This time we can't tell what's going on because it's silting up. But there is um, there's a whole dose of good place name evidence round and about here, um, and um, some good historic maps that show anchorage show um, I think a, a more of an entrance into the ooze itself, and there is a question mark as to whether this is a, um, one of those harbours that in other places are called hubs going on. So um, with the fresh water coming down the middle, um, totally enclosed and a place where you could um, take a boat in and be quite secure just to set it down and then when the tide flowed in you could come out from your um, secure little harbour for small boats. There's one in Egglesey that works still um, called the Hobbit in Egglesey. So we had a little look at that. We've been looking at these um, different landscapes around different bays. In we we um, had a wee foray around the one in Mill Bay in Gersey. And here, you can't see it here, but take, take my um, word for it. The um, 18th century map here has got a big harbour sign in there. And underneath the water, are these um, mounds of ballast in the harbour. Some of them are quite late because they have slated, you know, imported slate. So, I'm just going to try to show you the sort of richness of, of this material and um, Obviously, we're not just working um, alone across across the world. Caroline's showing you, and here we are um, with a national um, coastal change uh, assessment. Now, this is this is a dynamic coast. This is looking at what's happening to the coast 
all around Scotland um, on a national basis, not just focusing on the historic environment, but having a great deal of impact on how we plan for the historic environment, because it can be seen all the way around the coast that um, in the last 50 years there's been quite a good deal of erosion. So, as Caroline says, sea level curve is, is levelling off, um, has levelled off, but today, and if you go, there's a great website, people who are interested in that, the National Library of Scotland have got the old maps that go back to the first edition of the survey, and you can overlay current, um, current um, satellite on the top and see what's happened. And as Caroline pointed out, you can see that it changes in different places, you know, depending on how, how the weather's been, um, how soft the entrance to a bay might be, um, whether, for instance, um, what have people been doing in the last 100 years? You know, we all know that, for instance, the building of barriers has changed the coastline of the of that part, you know, the conjoined islands, uh, absolutely enormously. So there are pockets of sand where there used to be pockets of sand, and where did that come from? And is that being is that sand um, uh, is is that sand actually being taken, for instance, out of the dunes in one place and shifted round, and then being distributed in a different fashion to the to what it might have been if the barriers weren't there and the answer to that is of course yes but um, it's what we do to the landscape is very significant so for instance here I've got um, the Martello Tower in Hoy um, which was threatened very badly by being undermined by the sea and um, it was protected for many years by these gabions now, wherever you build a hard front, you find that the edges, um, the ends of that hard reinforcement, take a good battering from the sea. The seas are actually diverted around the ends, and quite a lot of the beach in front of the hard barrier um, has got a sort of scooped effect in the front. Now, that, so that's a change. And so, and there is a, a theory that um, we should we should be careful of what we do, of course, because it, we might have unintended effects. We might make it really bad for somebody further, a little bit further down the coast. However, you know, when you have a beloved object that there, and um, you know, it seems a small price to pay have a bit more erosion there and a bit more erosion around the corner perhaps in order to stop it being undermined. And that, you know, little bit of propping up has worked for a generation maybe, and maybe in another generation we'll be able to think of a better way of sustaining it. Now, people have always been um, working to try and um, keep a keep a firm hold on, on what they value. So here's a house that's been protected by cassid stones. And this dune here is nearby. And you can see a failed casting going on here. I don't know how long that lasted for. It might have lasted for a generation to prevent the sea taking this dune. And behind it um, is our work which is tires chained together and this is holding this tune pretty well and the tires aren't scattering themselves down the coast either so this has been a very successful um, uh, piece of sustaining um, coastline in Sandy good experiment I would say so um, you know I'm talking about protecting things, you have to find out what's there. So here is Scarabray when it was under excavation in the 
twenties, and um, we're obviously every site is an individual, and we'll never find another scale of bread. But we have to think, you know, nowadays there is one small seawall out the front of this that's protecting it, and a really big hitter of a storm could really do some damage to those fragile houses. In the 1950s, the sea overtopped Scarabray and took out the end wall of house number one, which is now rebuilt, and that's why it's got a window. So, um, uh, you need to find out what's there. If, if this work hadn't been done, and it had been just left chiseled, chisel, chisel, chisel away at it, we would have known there was a Neolithic site there, but potentially we wouldn't have known how, how glorious it was. There are sites, for instance, Hodgley in Westry, where it looks like the same sort of level of preservation is possible um, for a later site, for an Iron Age site. Um, but we don't know what the site is, really, because we can't get into it in any, in any depth. So, one of the ways of conserving the sites is to find out what there is there first. And um, I'll put this up because it's such a sad picture. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, you know, you have to question, are we doomed, doomed, doomed? Or can we adapt to what's happening? And uh, quite clearly, we can adapt because 100 years ago there was a wall built at Scarabray. It's the centre of our tourism industry. It's an absolutely iconic site. Post war, it got to be a world heritage site, and people all around the world think it's wonderful. So it's not just us. So this wall, this wall comes around the front, and then you can see where uh, the uh, the metal um, structure of the seawall is that I was exposed a couple of years back with a um, with a with the battering effect of the sea coming around the ends of the seawall. Likewise there's a mound here that's full of Iron Age um, material that is being eroded and no doubt the seawall at the front assisted in the erosion of that. Where, where the photographer was standing um, is close to a mill building that is now gone on that, on that coast. So you can't keep everything, but it, building a wall from time to time is a very sensible thing to do. So find out what it is, and then that perhaps we can keep it for a generation or two. And if sustainability means that what we're doing is we're passing our stuff to the next generation, then a, s a small investment may keep it for long enough for us to get over our um, uh, lack of willingness to invest in, in cultural heritage, really. Um, and so, so, and in a place like this, where we have these assets, which are world-beating assets, we need to be thinking what we're going to do about finding out some more about some others of them so that we spread the risk. So that if one site goes, obviously it's irreplaceable, but we can perhaps move our, um, move our economic focus. And um, we need a plan B for sustainable development. This is something that came out of this um, risk assessment workshop that, um, that a lot of us here were actually involved in um, in Stromness in, earlier in the year and which is now a beautifully produced booklet and um, on the web for free and um, assesses, like it says, how vulnerable is the um, World Heritage Site to climate change. Now I've just been talking about coastal erosion and of course, climate change, as we've seen this year, is affecting us um, also with, for instance, like these, these downpours of rain, which were quite unusual in the past, but which we're getting used to now, but which have a different effect on the archaeology, particularly when it's combined with tourism. So that's the end of that.
and uh, hopefully I haven't done it, I mean, we've done it too badly. <laughs>